next up is Malola's current penis from Bioenergy Europe, uh, the voice of uh, bioenergy in uh, Europe. And there, Mr. Karampinis is the Director of Business Development uh, and Membership. He will give us insights into bioenergy as a sustainable enabler for the heat transition in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction, and you did a very good job in pronouncing my name, no problem at all. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'm uh, Manolis Karampinis. Uh, I work in Bioenergy Europe since October 2022. Uh, before that, uh, I've been working for 16 years at Center for Research and Technology in LAS, uh, mostly dealing with uh, EU projects. I even coordinated a few myself. And I know for the project people, it's a bittersweet moment when you are at a final event because soon you're wrapping up whatever you did as a consortium for the last three or four years. I don't know exactly what was your duration. So my thoughts go to you <laughs> in this, let's say, time. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I would like to say something about what I think Ingo yesterday, in, when I sent him the presentation, mentioned that Bioenergy is the, the bad boy of the renewables in the heating sector. So it falls to me to defend its honor and explain why this is an important contributor uh, to the European uh, heating uh, system and what perhaps can be done in the future. But before I go into the, the core of my presentation, a few things about Bienzi Europe. Some of you might know us as IBIOM. That was the first name that we had when we were founded in the 1990s. Uh, we are a members-based trade association in Brussels. We have around 190 members. Uh, the core of the membership are the national biomass and Bienzi associations from the different member states. And we have around 150 members which are uh, companies from all uh, steps of the bioenergy value chain, from fuel producers to traders, end users, equipment providers, consultancies, VIP, for example, is one of our members, uh, and a few research and academic partners. Uh, we are hosting uh, the European Pellet Council, a network of the national pellet associations uh, from the member states. We are involved in two uh, certification schemes. EN Plus is probably the most well-known one because it's been in the market for many years and has to do with the fuel quality of wood pellets for residential consumption. And we are also a shareholder in the SUR scheme. This is a sustainability certification scheme which was developed to meet the requirements for biomass sustainability uh, under the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, we provide many services to our members, such as the EU policy monitoring and influence, market intelligence, and of course, visibility and networking opportunities. Just a screenshot of our members, from which you can see nothing here, but you can <laughs> find everybody, everything in our uh, website. And uh, for your information, a lot of our work is being done on working groups. Uh, again, this is something we provide to our members only, and the working group uh, themes are concerning the, the main topics of interest for the bioenergy sector of shareholders. So we have a working group obviously for domestic heating where we follow a policy files such as eco-design and eco-labeling. We have, I coordinate this in fact, a working group on pellets, uh, a working group also on the agrobiomass supply. We have a working group on wood supply and then we have competitiveness dealing with, for example, uh, EU state aid, electricity market reform, all the, let's say, the difficult and hard to follow policy files. Sustainability, one of the, mo the most popular, let's say, working groups we have because it follows Red 2, Red 3, and all the, the critical aspects about why biomass is uh, sustainable. We recently launched a, a working group on carbon dioxide removals. This is the, the very hot topic now in the bioenergy sector, how uh, bioenergy and a few other technologies can contribute to carbon removals for the hard to abate sectors and a task force on national advocacy, which is how we coordinate essentially with national associations for promotion. We are also involved in a few EU projects, uh, which allow us to expand a bit our horizons. Uh, this is not uh, an intended um, wordplay. A few of them are horizon projects, though. Uh, and also uh, allow us to focus into more specific uh, aspects. Uh, recently, as a matter of fact, I was coordinating this project for my previous job. Uh, we were involved in the AgroBioHeat project. This is very relevant for replays because AgroBioHeat really had to do with uh, promoting uh, modern, cost-effective and low-emission uh, biomass technologies using agrobiomass resources. Anything from straw to olive stones, prunings, whatever you can have from the agricultural sector, and you can easily, fairly easily use them in rural settings. 
We are also involved in another ongoing project, this one, a life project ready for heat, and it has to do with how the NCPs, uh, National Energy and Climate Plans, have to take into consideration the targets for the renewable heating and cooling sectors, and we approach this both on the EU level and also on five specific member states. Uh, we are, another project which also has to do with heat, I will have a slide about this later on, is Rare for Industry, and it is industrial use of renewable energy, in energy intensive industries. And there we are talking about high temperature heat, and this is another area in which biomass can contribute. And music finished in the last month is a bit more specialized topic about thermally processed biomass uh, uh, types, which can be used as specialized replacements in, for example, the metallurgical industry, in the transport sector, and so on. So, a few things about bioheat in the EU framework. I think most of this information has already been transmitted one way or another. We know that heating and cooling is a big chunk, uh, almost half of the total energy consumption in Europe. And uh, out of the renewable heat that we have, 85% is actually coming from bioenergy. Bioenergy, of course, is all the present both in the electricity and in the transport sector in different forms. Uh, if you go into a bit more details about the heating and cooling sector, I mentioned before, uh, the bioheat there uh, is around 70%. 78% is fossil fuels. This really shows that we do need a lot of things to do about decarbonizing the heating uh, sector. And if you look at the specific centers of consumption, around half of the heating and cooling, let's say, demand goes into the residential sector. So I think this really explains why projects such as Replace are essential. Uh, another, let's say, 27% is also coming from industry, and we have also derived heat, which also, of course, partly serves the residential sector as well. Um, here is a slide about the renewable energy uh, share in the heating and cooling sector by 2020. So this is the, the blue bar and the, the, the vertical uh, thing is the, the target of the NCPs by 2030. Uh, you see that many member states still have a long way to go to reach the 2030 targets. But my point here, obviously coming from a biomass perspective, is that the, the countries in which uh, you see a very high share of uh, renewable uh, heating already, and the, the ones that are quite close to their targets, are mostly coming from Scandinavia, from the Nordics, uh, where there is a very long tradition of using biomass as a heating source. Uh, we are often talking about EU uh, averages, but we should also consider, obviously, that the situation on the member state level, even on the local level or the regional level, is very, very much different. So if we look, let's say, again, at the heating and cooling uh, consumption in the residential sector, uh, on the EU level, it's a quite wide mix of fuels. Natural gas, I think, at the moment has the biggest share, but it is fairly similar to other uh, contributions. But if you look on specific member states, there you see very interesting differentiations. Poland, for example, uh, not only is it a big market, but it's the, maybe the only country, along I think with Bulgaria, perhaps in a few minor other examples, in which solid fossil fuels, essentially coal, have a particular contribution in the heating consumption of the households. And of course, for the bioenergy sector, this is a very good opportunity to substitute. If you look onto others, like my country, Greece or Ireland, heating oil is still an important contributor. Uh, and uh, in many of those countries, the replacement uh, policy of the governments has been to substitute heating oil by natural gas. This didn't go very well, as you can imagine, in the last uh, year or so. Yeah, uh, another slide about the final energy consumption in households on the EU level, again, this shows that uh, technologies such as the heat pumps have increased significantly in the last uh, years, let's say. Uh, you see also an increasing trend in solar thermal, and geothermal still almost at a very stable levels. But clearly, let's say, bioenergy is the, the biggest contributor. This was also mentioned before by other speakers. And why is this the case? I think f for me and for most people, the reason why people go for bioenergy solutions is because of the cost effectiveness. It's not about the sustainability, especially on the household level. Bioenergy is really the cheapest solution for many households, and especially low-income households, rural households. This is the thing they can find 
on the backyard, let's say, so they are using bioenergy because uh, they can't. It's not always the case. There are obviously consumers who go for biomass-based solutions because they want a carbon neutral solution, but we should also consider these aspects as well. And another thing that was mentioned before, we know that there are many heating systems in Europe which are very, very old and thus very, very inefficient. And this concerns, of course, several systems which are, would be labeled as bioenergy ones. We have open fireplaces, we have very old and polluting wood stoves. And obviously, when you're talking about replacement, we want to replace also the oil systems, the natural gas systems, but we should also consider gradually the replacement or the upgrade of the systems as well, because we have better efficiency, lower losses, less material used, and obviously lower cost, and of course, to reduce the pollutants, particle emissions, and their impact on the human health. Uh, I have two slides here about uh, bioheating derived heat. The text here is not appropriate, sorry for that. Uh, so for derived heating, so district heating, uh, bioenergy is also an important contributor. It has tripled, I think, its share from 2000 until 2020. And a lot of district heating systems are relying on uh, biomass and bioenergy as a big part of their um, Fuel mixture, I think again, the, some countries in the Baltics, like Lithuania, have done an excellent job in phasing out natural gas with biomass. And also bioheat, uh, I know this is not a topic of the conference, but maybe I have to say something here, is very important also for several industries. Of course, the industries that rely mostly on bioenergy are the ones that are dealing with biomass, let's say, one way or another and I'm talking about wood processing industries and food processing industries. Obviously, some of these have uh, residues from their processes which they can use in-house for covering their own thermal needs, and this is in fact what uh, wood processing plants, uh, oil oil, olive oil production plants, uh, sunflower oil production plants are doing, and even they have leftover quantities which they sell to other consumers. But now we have also an increasing trend. Uh, this is not captured so much statistically, rather by individual interests of market players on uh, non-biomass sectors, things like cement, uh, lime, um, and uh, chemical plants, magnesia, more specialized industries, where they are really looking into biomass as a way to produce high temperature heat, because at the moment they really don't have much alternatives beyond the fossil ones and hydrogen, which might come in the future, but at what cost and how exactly it will be integrated remains to be seen. Uh, a few things about bioheat from pellets. I don't know how I'm doing with time, so please tell me if I need to speed up or not. Uh, why am I focusing on pellets? Because when we're talking about residential appliances, I think I understood this message also from the Replace Project partners. Pellets, I could say, are something like the state of the art in uh, the, um, the bioenergy uh, residential sector. I don't think I need to show you what a pellet is. Uh, looking like. I hope that most of you are familiar uh, with it. But the key advantage is that it's a densified product, meaning that you can use it even in places where you have uh, space limitations, uh, even sometimes in urban uh, settings, something you cannot do easily with wood logs, for example, or with wood chips. And uh, also the, the, uh, the technology of the pellet appliances have really gone a very long way, and now we are talking about systems, both stoves, for local space heating or boilers, which are both, let's say, I would say, aesthetically pleasing, especially for the stoves. This is an important aspect because it's something you have often in your living room and it replaces one of the quintessential features of the human life, you know, the open fireplace for many years. Uh, but also we are talking about improved combustion technologies and emission control, either with primary measures or with secondary measures sometimes so electrostatic precipitators and so on for controlling emissions. We are talking now about increased uh, smart combinations of uh, pellet appliances with other uh, renewable solutions, with PVs, with sometimes with solar thermal, with storage solution. Many manufacturers now are offering complete packages on that. We are talking about remote control options, so technology you can, let's say, switch on, switch off, or regulate them through your mobile phone. We are talking about automated feeding and us cleaning systems. Obviously, at the end of the day, there is some manual cleaning required in any kind of biomass burning appliance, but the frequency is very much reduced. We are talking about many other uh, aspects. So, yeah, when we're talking about pellets, we're not talking about, you know, the 
very old and traditional things that someone might associate with um, wood uh, heating. Um, and uh, regarding uh, the, the hot topic, uh, the environmental topic when it comes to residential appliances, the, the emissions, here I have just one example from one of our members. Uh, I just found this for convenience sake. Obviously other, let's say, manufacturers are also having other technologies with excellent results. Uh, so this is from Ecofen from Austria and it's one of the newest product, the Zero Flame technology, and it really shows how it converts in terms of uh, particle emissions versus, let's say, uh, older heating oil appliances. And you see, for example, that a pellet boiler can actually outperform an old oil boiler in terms of particle emissions. And the, the pa right part of the slide, this is also quite interesting. If you have such a boiler using three tons of pellets per year, you see the blue bar is the amount of particles you emit, and this is much less than the average car tire abrasion for 15,000 kilometers of drive, or less than say that the average particle emissions per household for the German New Year uh, Day celebrations. So this is, let's say, the level of environmental uh, impact that modern appliances now can achieve, and this is what the standard we are aspiring to in the pellet sector. And now, if you're looking at uh, what it means for the, for the markets, uh, the residential uh, pellet market is around half of the uh, European pellet consumption. The other half goes to the big industrial end users, the, the big power plants that are using pellets for electricity production. Uh, I would say that on average, around 12% of the total fossil fuels used in uh, Europe on an energy basis are actually pellets. The rest are wood logs, wood chips, agrobiomass assortments, and so on. And uh, you can see that more or less uh, the market has increased steadily over the years, and we even saw a higher increase in the, let's say, post-pandemic years uh, of an 80% from 2020 to 2021. Uh, the residential, uh, the commercial sector, on the other hand, slightly bigger uh, pellet boilers uh, for hotels and municipal buildings and so on, has is developing but still remains at a much uh, smaller level than the residential market and for me this is kind of a big missed opportunity here because in many of these applications you have a, let's say even a more specialized skill set so if you have a municipality you have some engineers uh, or some people who can really take care into the pellet feeding the cleaning of the boilers and so on so i think this is something we might look or should look more in the future uh, again, when it comes to the, the main markets for pellets, uh, I have to confess this slide is a bit skewed because it in groups together residential consumption of for heat plus the CHP uh, consumption of pellets. And CHP is very relevant for Scandinavia, for Denmark also because their power plants are producing heat for district heating. Uh, but uh, if you focus really on the residential market, you have some very big uh, players like Italy, where let's say the, it's actually the biggest market in uh, Europe for pellets, for residential pellets, and it's mostly in uh, stoves appliances, so, so very small appliances. But Germany, France, of course, are also big markets, and you have many other upcoming markets as well. Uh, and this is the some slides from our statistical reports. Uh, so these are the annual sales of stoves in the top EU uh, countries. So again, you see the effect of the post-COVID recovery with the 25% increase uh, in uh, stove sales, uh, the top countries being France, Italy, and uh, Spain. And a large part of this, let's say, um, of this trend is coming also from governmental support measures, incentives to switch appliances uh, to high efficiency and low emission stoves. And the same goes for the boiler market where we have an even more impressive increase of uh, sales in the post COVID years. Uh, and we have, let's say, the, the, the one of the top sellers is actually Poland where they had, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, another program uh, for, um, yeah, supporting the pellet, uh, sales of pellet boilers and we have one of the biggest increases we ever saw in the sales of the pellet markets. Um, I know that many are considering on the EU level electrification one way or another as a relevant component of uh, decarbonizing the heating sector in households. So uh, what would be the role of pellets in such a scenario? 
Uh, here, this is a slide that I shamelessly copied from the Swedish Pellet Association because it really shows the, one of the messages I think that we can provide in the future. This is an initiative they are still going to start quite soon uh, about installing uh, 200,000 uh, uh, pellet stoves in Swedish households. This means around 10% of Swedish homes. And uh, if you consider that each stove would have an average of five kilowatts of uh, installed power, and you do the calculation, this is equivalent to the electrical power of one nuclear reactor. I guess they compare with nuclear because there is, as I understand, an ongoing discussion in Sweden about having new uh, nuclear power plants, but obviously you can do the same conversion and com with wind farms, solar EVs, and so on. So th the point being that uh, if you have, let's say, such a stock of appliances, you can really reduce the strain on the electricity system, and I think this is becoming increasingly important. Uh, because we already hear from some countries that have switched more and more to heat pumps that the, the grid is struggling a bit with the increased demand. So this is another argument that we will have to use in our arsenal. Um, I have to say, if I have some time, a few things about prices uh, because, yeah, unavoidably some people will comment, but yeah, we all heard that last year we had tremendous increases in uh, the pellet prices, and that's true. Uh, I have to stress out some points out here. First, that uh, for many years, the price stability was a key uh, selling point for pellets. If you look at this figure from the Austrian Prime Association, before 2020, the pellets were more or less stable and independent of the fluctuations in the oil price. Uh, what took, uh, what was required for this to change was a global energy crisis. All energy products increased, including pellets. And if uh, I have to discuss a bit why pellets increase, I don't think I have the time to go here. There are multiple issues, uh, but obviously one thing was the disruption of the Russian pellet supply. Uh, you had also the very high increases in production costs that you have to consider. If you increase your electricity, then obviously the pellet prices go up, and there was also other things like panic in the market. What we have seen, and this is not shown in this graph, is that the prices have already gone down already. But of course, the long-term stabilization, the level at which the pellet market will stabilize, hopefully in the coming years, and what are the long-term implications of the pellet markets and whether we have lost, let's say, in abundance, or hopefully not, remains to be seen. So, final messages, and I'll wrap this up. Uh, Bioenergy is the largest contributor to the renewable heating sector in Europe, and it's not only sustainability, but the cost competitiveness, the reason for this. Uh, the current stock of heating appliances includes many inefficient ones, both fossil and bioenergy ones, and obviously these need to be replaced. The modern pellet appliances have proven environmental performance and feature many other uh, features that make them attractive to consumers and they can assist in the smooth energy transition. One point, specifically about the AgroBike Heat project, I didn't have the time to mention this in my presentation, but yeah, in many markets, not only pellets, but other assortments like olive stones can have very, very good results in modern appliances. We have demonstrated with AgroBike Heat that we can have the equivalent, with some fractions at least, with eco-design levels for wood appliances. So this is a very important result, and I can happily take questions about that. But finally, we need clean and consistent policies and governmental support to convince consumers to switch appliances en masse. And unfortunately, bioenergy is often marginalized or overlooked. We had tremendous responses from the governments regarding the increases of the natural gas prices, we had tremendous increases when it comes to electricity prices, but usually, in most countries, I think, the pellet sector was left to fend for itself. And one of the reasons why we had this uh, price increases because the market was left totally uh, unsupported in this uh, crazy environment. And when I'm talking about the, the clean and consistent policies, the concluding slide is about this, enabling uh, consumers to make choices. You may have heard that there is a proposal from the European Commission about the merger of the eco-labeling. Uh, this means that all, let's say, the heating products for consumers will be put under a single label, and if you compare their, let's say, efficiency on a single scale, then all solid fuel appliances, but also the most efficient, I would say, fossil ones, would go into the very low ends of the labeling scale, while only heat pumps will go in the higher. And for us, this is not the best uh, outcome, because really we are talking about different products with different characteristics, and when you put all the fossil uh, 
sorry, all the solid fuel boilers or stoves in the same category, you do not allow the consumer to make the proper choice and select the most optimal one for them. I think that's all from my side, and will be a little longer than the schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights and also showing us that we still have a little bit uh, to go. Uh, any questions here, comments on this presentation?